morning, everybody. Welcome to the Chimerical session. Chimerical is a tea from the Wui Mountains. It's a cliff tea. We've been over the last five weeks or so. Let's see. Let's get this correct. We've been over the last three weeks. This will be week number four in the Wulong category. And we started out, and hopefully you took good notes, with Southern Oolong, with Golden Oss Manthus, and you got the overall simple version of how Oolong tea is made. And then we progressed. Last week we had enlightenment. We were in the mountain, uh, not at the very heart of in the mountain. In between that, we had half in the mountain, Golden Buddha. So we went from Golden Osmanthus, Golden Buddha, Enlightenment, and today, Chimerical. And over the next three weeks, including today, we are in the mountain. So it's like I'm making a big deal about mountains. In the mountain, half in the mountain, outside the mountain. What is this mountain? You know, Peter was in here yesterday and asked a great question. He said, okay, I'm going through these cliff tees now. Why is it you have such a variation between the minerality? What is it about either the varietal or the processing technique. What is it in general that determines minerality? Great, great question. And as I was reflecting on that, I knew I should talk about that today because we've talked about a lot of things related to Wulong teas. And we've talked about the fact that minerality exists but we really haven't talked about the elements going into minerality. So before this session ends today, you're going to have a better understanding of that. You will have tasted a beautiful in the mountain tea. And we're over this next three weeks going to get into a much more detailed description of how this tea is made because 25 to 30 steps is not seven to nine steps. Golden Osmanthus, six, seven, eight, or nine steps. These teas, 25 to 30 steps. So we're not going to start with the making so much today. We're going to do that next week. Genesis next week. Today, we're going to talk about minerality. So where does this minerality come from? It sounds to me, you know, as an American, I take my minerals every day. Is that the minerality we're talking about? We take some manganese and some iron and just flop it on the ground. Maybe the tea absorbs that. Or even worse, maybe at the tea shop, we just take one of those mineral pills and throw it in your tea. So let me disabuse you of that last idea. No, we don't do that. The minerality comes from the tea itself. Why? And why are there differences from outside the mountain, half in the mountain, and fully in the mountain? Let's think of terrar. And now we're thinking first of geological, geographical terrar. In the mountain area is this seven point, traditionally, this 7.7 .7 square kilometer area where it's close to all the volcanic rock. You have lots of red sandstone. You have a semi-wild environment. What do I mean by that? It's not been cultivated and put into a bunch of monoclonal positions. You haven't in the past had a bunch of agrochemicals used in this area. This is original. 
And it's the original way. You can go back a thousand years or 2000 years. And this area looked approximately as it does today and was not affected by life around it. So what do I mean? I mean that the big life, in other words, industrialization, trying to organize a country, all these things which influence agriculture. No, this area has stayed essentially the same. You have heirloom plants in this area. And in this area, some parts of it, I said wild, truly wild. We talked last week using the non-glamorous term vegetable, vegetables and vegetable clusters. We talked about that last week. You get these so-called clusters here in the midst of a bunch of other plants, in the midst of all the flora and fauna that are sharing this area with the tea that's not planted in a monoclonal arrangement. In a way, for those of you who went with us to Yuna, to the Ila Mountains, when we were deep in the forest and you saw all these different varietals of trees and ferns and mosses, it's the same thing in the mountain. Well, it's not exactly the same. What's the difference? In Ilao, you saw trees that were two, 3,000 years old. Here, these heirloom plants, probably no more than five or 600 years old. But for tea bushes, that's a long time. And when they're growing in the midst of other plants and animals, all of these things are affecting the plant. And so some of these, not some, many of these are self-propagating. In other words, they, they're grown from seed, essentially. Not all, but many of them. So this is what deep in the mountain, this area looks like. Therefore, there's more diffuse sunlight in this area. There's more uh, mountains rising out of this area. They're volcanic. There's more fog in this area. And it's drip, 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 drip. It drips down to where the plants are. There's more minerals from the surrounding area. So one of the elements which is very important in this area is minerality which comes from this terrar slash environment. Is varietal important? Yes, it is. How about farmer skill in processing? Is that important? Absolutely. So this all goes into why this is more mineral. So hence, I now have to talk about two other things. One is, why has the change in definition of in the mountain been important to people like you and me who are tea drinkers? Because the traditional definition was a 7.7 .7 square kilometer area. Now, the government has allowed a larger area definition. And as soon as you change area, size of area, you're going to change the terrain, aren't you? Stuff that used to be half in the mountain, oh, it's now in the mountain. With a stroke of a pin, you changed what you're getting out of an area. It's like going to France and going to Burgundy. Oh, you know what? Let's make Burgundy larger and let's let it overflow in the Champagne area. The nature of what you've done for a long time of tradition changes. So 
when we talk of in the mountain here, we're really traditionalists. We're back in that 7.7 .7 square kilometer area. That's how we define in the mountain. Are we aligned with how it's defined currently in China? We are not aligned, but here's the reason why, and you see that. All right, before we walk down this minerality road much more, let's talk about one other very important thought that I want you to leave with today, because it is driving what we're doing at the shop. I told you we before, I told you at the beginning of the year, oh no, we're not going to order more tea. Well, I'm happy to report for the 11th consecutive year I've lied. You would think after years one and two and people point out, you know, you said things were a certain way. You would think that as an understudy, I could get that corrected. I'm going to tell you why in great detail, why this has happened. Yes. Peter asked, was this right redefinition of what is in the mountain a government support of commerce or a push by local farmers to be included? Great question. So Peter said, who had to be asked? Who had to be bribed in order to change this definition of in the mountain? And who was doing the bribing? Oh, wait a minute, he didn't use that word. But the sense was, what was the reason for a change? The reason was something that we talked about last week. You have a strict definition and you say the line is here. And so you put one foot over that line and you say, well, I picked from here and it's really the same and it tastes the same. Why isn't this in the mountain? And so at some point, both the farmers and the government came to a new agreement that, yeah, we should expand this in the mountain. Let's think about what incentivizes people to do an agreement like that. The most important thing is commerce, isn't it? If there is this incredible pressure by the market, not here in the US, but in China, by the market to, A, I want in the mountain, and there just isn't that much of it. Eventually, everybody says, you know what? Let's make sure we have more. We don't have to do something stupid, but we're going to come together, we're going to come to an agreement, and we're going to expand the area. They didn't leave the park. They're still within the World Heritage Site. And so there is a certain logic to say, well, this whole site is well-preserved, no pesticides. So we're going to expand the definition of in the mountain. In the meantime, farmers are going to become more enriched, right? Because those farmers who just over the line, all of a sudden, oh, I can say mine is in the mouth. Oh, I'm going to get a benefit from it. Taxes are better, right? Because as a government, hey, okay, people, market demands, we satisfy, it's in the mouth. But you know, people like you and me, the one percenters or the 99 percenters, whatever, connoisseurs, we don't accept we drive our decisions by taste. Taste dictates where we're going to be and what we're going to call in the mountain. Taste and tradition, specifically with Biju and my decision to do this. But we're giving you what the Chinese have done and we're not arguing with it because we understand the principle. But from a taste perspective, we want that stuff that has that special minerality that's in this area that has all these depressions 
and mountains where the actual content of the soil is a certain way which influences the the highest quality of this tea yes have the chinese research institute that studies tea compared soil content from what is undeniably in the mountain versus undeniably outside the mountain yeah so the question is is the research institute that does all the cliff teas and all the teas actually in, in Northern Fujian province, which analyzes them and does experimentation, helps create new hybrids and so forth. Have they done a study of soil content across the area that they help regulate? And the answer is yes, they have. And therefore, when they're doing hybrids, one of the first things they ask themselves is where location-wise, soil-wise, are we thinking that this should go? So absolutely, this has been done. And yet, at the end of the day, a market decision was made and not an illogical one. So I'm not trying to say the decision was wrong. Far from it, because the pressure of the market pressure of the market still exists. And by the way, the pressure of the market is why I lie year after year, because, you know, uh, particularly this year, I was very strong in January. I said, yeah, I've had 10 straight lies, no more lying, we're not gonna buy this year. I said that out loud. I can't believe that I said that out loud. I should have just said it in my head. And from now on, I'm only going to say that in my head so that I'm not called out for public. Um, so what has driven us to this point? Why is it year after year we change our minds? Because this year in particular, we're seeing obvious effects of global warming. We're seeing damage in areas that we haven't seen damage before. We're seeing a tendency of the market to think about maybe we should consolidate. So if you think of farms consolidating, think of America. What happened when the farmers sold out to the big agro farmers, you had industrial farming. Industrial farming means that we could feed many more people than we did in the past. But it meant that the craft farming, the heritage farming reduced. And as it reduced, the quality of what was available to us became more uniform. And so if there were problems in that uniformity, they were uniform problems. And you didn't, you had a reduction in availability of some of the craft farm, farming techniques. You didn't eliminate all of them. And, you know, example is wheat. Rob helped me find an heritage wheat producer. Incredible. The taste is incredible. And it doesn't have the problem of glyphosate. This thing, it just truly incredible. And it, it, but this isn't what industrial farming looks like. And we're afraid, we have fear in our hearts that if somehow there's a consolidation in the tea industry, we're going to start to see this same uniformity. We're not there yet, but we're seeing elements and we're seeing global warming. And so we're thinking to ourselves, wait a minute, our shop isn't about uniformity. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's about those special circumstances that we year after year look for find and bring back to you 
stuff that you can experience now and maybe 10 years from now, heck, maybe five years from now, not available, cannot find it, won't be there. And as we grok the seriousness of this, as we understand all the directions that we're seeing in this, this makes us change our mind. Particularly this year, here come my excuses, global warming evidences made us reconsider our entire thought. And so we put in an order this week. And in about 30 days, we will have new cliff tees, brand new cliff tees. So actually, I bring you this news with great glee, even though I had to lie for the 11th straight time to get to this spot. Not going to happen again. Not out loud again. All right. Yes. Uh, Jeremy asked, would minority farmers be a part of a potential consolidation? Uh, this is a really interesting question that Jeremy has posed. So her real question is, since minority farmers play a large role in Yunnan and in some other pockets in China in the tea industry, would they want to be part of that consolidation? Would they be forced into that consolidation? Or could they stand alone? Policies change. I can't 100% with certainty say what the future is. I can tell you what the past has been. Doing. And then from that, we can kind of draw a line to what the future probably would be. So minority farmers, particularly in Yunnan, probably will continue to have tea independence. And what I mean by that, they're shepherds of ancient trees. The ancient trees in our lifetimes are never going to be re replicated. Therefore, and they're seen and appreciated with that value. Those farmers will tend to probably be, for the most part, left alone. Because these are cultural trees. They represent Chinese culture. So the government has no incentive to go and say, well, hey, let's make this all tea fields. No. They understand the value of ancient trees and how those are viewed and how they can go backwards and kind of understand the evolution of tea. They understand that very well. So in Yunnan, particularly where there is heirloom stock, probably little to no change for those farmers in the foreseeable future from a policy standpoint. From a global warming standpoint, hey, all bets are off. Cannot tell you. Don't know the answer. We're not in control. No one's in control. Turns out that's the global warming part portion of that. Now, when you move to other parts of China that aren't Southwest China, so let's pretend that that answer, which focused on Yunnan, includes all of Southwest China. So Yunnan, Sichuan, Guangxi, and let's move more into Central China. Those farmers, some of whom are minorities, may be influenced and may have more pressure to respond to modernization. Remember, this is in the infant stages. It's not, it's in the infant stages, but once there's a practical way to do it, it will probably move faster. In some ways, 
there's this tension between craft tea and consumer desire for that craft tea, particularly in China, and industrial farming. Because market tea does not taste like craft tea, period. End of story. And so there is that pushback there. So you've got all of these factors, but if change is going to happen and it's related to minority areas, it would be in the areas where they're ensconced within Han areas. Because if it starts to happen in the Han areas, it undoubtedly will roll through the minority areas there. Okay. So a long answer to a short but important question. Thank you, Jeremy. So, Vijay and I, we continue to keep our eye on all these elements as we try and make decisions year by year. Should we buy or should we not buy? The Chinese, we could, in a I blink sell much of our stock back to the Chinese because they know we have really good stuff and they know we've taken good care of this stuff. But that's not what our intent is. Our intent is to continue to search for, look for, and procure the really good stuff while it's available. All right, I've given and I've talked, but what I haven't provided is demonstration. And even worse for you who are sitting there thirsty, I haven't provided sustenance. So I can tell from the look in the tea master's eye that I should start to think about sustenance. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to bring forth the numinous tea master, Biju. Hey, good morning. Good morning. We do is a rock tea. Yan cha, huh? So, this I prefer, huh? So, also, so, yeah, so super clean. So, this is for her, Just open it. Yeah. So, the tableau is what you've seen the last three weeks. Got a tray, we've got a 16 ounce Yixing pot, we have another Yixing pot, we have a couple glasses. If you had an Yixing slash ceramic pot and one glass, that's all you really need. The, but there are some things you should notice. At this championship caliber, and you will notice as you start to get out your bags and get those prepared. Okay. Wow. A lot of tea leaves in here. Perhaps your math is bad. My math is not bad. It's eight grams and it's supposed to be eight grams. When you get into the mountain and it's really fine tea, because of how they're processing you use more. Do you change the temperature? Nope. Same temperature. You use more. And in some cases, you increase the time. So you're going to see that the instructions that we wrote, eight grams, that's what you have in your bags, four minutes. Andy asks, how did you arrive at the steeping time for this tea? Were certain elements missing when it was brewed for the more common two to two and a half minutes? Oh, this is a really good question. So Andy asked, when you make the rules for the team, do you just sit down and make up numbers and take guesses? Or do you do careful research and think about what you're tasting versus what you taste in the samples in China? And so it would be the latter. When we're working with tea masters in China, which we always do, 
before we make these type of purchases. They pour for us and they tell us, yeah, here's how we're perceiving this is the best tea. Here's what we think the best flavor is of this tea. We then take careful notes, just like you're doing, and come back here. And actually, we start the process in the Bowie Mountains because we have a small factory there. And we start experimenting. And then we'll invite some of these tea masters to come and we'll demonstrate what we're doing with large cup. And we'll say, how have we done? And we get commentary. So this isn't done in a vacuum. It's done very, very carefully, and it's done with Chinese uh, participation. Not, they're not actually carrying out the experiment because they don't know how exactly to do this, but they are doing the tasting along with us. And that's really, really important so that we get kind of a sign off in terms of have we captured the essence or what you would call the essence of the flavor of this particular variety. Yes. And Peter adds to the question about then also the grammage. Um, so is that the answer that also pertains to his question about why the larger grammage? Yes. So uh, Peter asks, and this is a, a great follow-up question, but do you just dream up the amount of grams or do you use a similar technique in terms of determining? And we do use a similar technique because when the tea masters in China are making the tea for us, we're taking good notes and we're taking good notes about the richness or the depth of the tea. And that kind of not kind of, it drives us to the spot where we eventually get to, ah, we got to increase it to get this depth. depth. If we just increase the time and don't increase the amount, eh, it comes out too astringent or too this or too that. And so we're always trying to keep that balance based upon what we taste in China. These are not things that we just kind of out of our heads. Well, does it taste good to us? No. This is how do you, Chinese tea masters, perceive? And by the way, what's great about using several is you get this range of opinions. And again, we take real good notes. And then we kind of go back. We synthesize everything. And again, that's the magic of what we do here. When we brew it, by the way, let's back up a minute. We've brewed all of these with more grams, fewer grams, longer, shorter, and this is where we've landed. And it's funny, some of these in the mountain teas, you know, we've increased to nine grams. Oh, that makes sense. Some, it's like, wow, too much. Eight? No, still too much. Seven? Yeah, okay, seven. And mixed with the right time. So this is stuff, this is a process. And the process is in cooperation with the people in China because we don't do this on our own. Let me back up. We created the 16-ounce the version of this on our own. That's our invention. But we don't determine whether the flavor is matching their standards. They tell us, oh yeah, that captures the standards. So in 2017, 2018, and 2019, three consecutive years, we had people from the tea industry, including tea masters, come to the shop and evaluate what we were doing. And just out of this world, surprised that we're able to match. And in some cases, their words were very reflective because they said, in some cases, this actually is a truer capture than what we're able to do. 
All right. And when you say then what we're able to do, you're talking about the small cup version? Yeah. Small cup version has a lot of variety, doesn't it? Because it's not codified in the same way. It is codified in terms of process, but it's not codified in terms of timing. It's not codified in terms of grants, by the way. So different regions. So for example, if you go to Chaozhou and they brew one of these teas, in a small guy water or in a very tiny pot, they step in, stuck in 10, 11 grams. It's like, oh my God. The first time I saw that, I said, mistake, mistake. You're talking, you're distracted, mistake. And the answer is no, because their codified methodology for pouring is different. And their expectations from a cultural perspective are different. In the Wui Mountains, they're the nine or 10 grams, eight, nine or 10 grams. And it's in a smaller pot or a small diary. For Westerners, that is incredibly difficult to control. And it's brutal. You can make a mess out of that within eight seconds. And once you've made a mess, it's really hard to recover. With our rules, no messes. Ours are tried and true. All right, so let's look at the color of this. Oh, beautiful, deep, deep, rich color. And almost all of you Maybe Andy is slightly too far away. In Lafayette, he probably can't smell this, but all of you within Oak can smell this from here. So we're going to enter the quality arena. What's the quality arena again? We're going to determine the stringency, mouthfeel, aftertaste, and then energetics. And remembering we're using a 200 degree liquid, we're going to inhale it. We're going <laughs> to burn our tongue doing this. So here we go. No, you're watching me. Here I go. Wow. A um, lot going on with this. Astringency. I'm taking a mental note of that. There's an aftertaste, very definite. Don't have the energetics yet. Now I'm going to do it for aroma, taste, and continue to explore energetics. Oh, I do have an energetic. Wow, that was fast. All right. Ah. Lots of stuff going on with this. Okay, it's your turn to brew. Remember, take good notes because these three consecutives are all different. Chimerical, Genesis, and Phantasmagoria. And think back to last week. Think back to enlightenment. When you drink this thing, you're going to think you're on a different... You were enlightened last week. This week. We're taking you to a different planet. Your turn to brew. What, what do you think? Sure. Yeah. Tea Master reminds me to mention that and to emphasize again, when you're doing small cup, there is a method standard. There isn't a rule standard by grams and time. Our magic is not only is there a method standard, there's less having to do with method because we've even standardized sizes and amounts. But there's a ton that has to do with actual brewing instructions. 
That's the difference. All right, so take bag number one, label chimerical, put it in your receptacle. Hopefully you have an Yixing pot. If you don't, and you're using ceramic, use the ceramic instructions. Draw your water, 200 degree water. Remember, it's not just the inside of the, the pot or ceramic. Make sure you pour on the outside to get as much heat going as possible. Set your timer. Since we're using the e shame, it's a four minute. Okay. So, what do the farmers say when we bring back large cups? They're always interested, they don't get exactly how we got to this but they enjoy it and so they do understand that a western audience is different particularly in light of the fact that westerners tend to like more and have time to have something that's prepared that's larger rather than going through an hour or two hour process of small cup and that's really the main reason that we ended up with this. That's why we did all this experimentation because in a rural setting, it's easy to do the two or three hours of sitting around, doing small cup, talking about village affairs. And there's just a different rhythm except during harvest time, a real different rhythm. As soon as you get urban, the rhythm changes. And so again, I've mentioned before that we've got this standing offer to open one of these shops either in Shanghai or Changsha. People will give us money. They want to throw money at our feet in order to open this type of a shop because they recognize what we've done here is just unique. Not only unique, it's great for the consumer. China has the same worries in the tea industry that we have in other industries. So let's focus in on their worry in the tea industry. In the tea industry, they're worried about the fact, hey, young people are coming along. They're drinking these other things. Why? Why are they drinking these other things? What is it about tea that they're not loving? It's good for you. It's not hard. Why are they drinking these RTD, ready to drink? A, the younger generation is doing what the younger generation years ago here did. They drift towards sweetness, sugar. That's one thing. And the industrial food complex pushes that upon or let's not say it that way. They respond to that in the population and they do more of these type of things. Same thing in China now. Secondly, you have coffee. Coffee, which has entered the Chinese vocabulary. You know, pre-1980, coffee was an abstraction. They saw it on movies that came from America. There's something there, there that they're drinking called coffee. I don't know what the heck that is. And nowadays, Starbucks is looked at as a luxury invite. So if you're going to try and show off in China and impress somebody, hey, uh, let's go down to the uh, local Starbucks. Uh, it's on me. It's expensive there, by the way, by Chinese standards. So there's this 
sense, there's this gradual competition which is arising. Yes. It makes me think about how we engage with our hot beverages with us and how much size matters. And if we're drinking something all day long, don't want to get up more urban life with activities where we anticipate sitting down for long periods of time and wanting to have uh, something that's right there that we can go to make repeatedly consistency, not have to waste time, a lot of time in the making. Um, so it, that sounds like you said rural for the more uh, highlighted that as an issue uh, as between an uh, issue between uh, 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 where it's more convenient or uh, the culture of small cup may remain and then this shift. And so I think of how many cups of coffee you might maybe one, one in a, your average American drinks in any one day. Yeah. Converted that into tea with the convenience of coffee. Wow. Yeah, and and that's exactly why uh, you. This is a great recap because you've emphasized and you've stated out loud what I've implied, which is that hey, if you can make this as easy as coffee has become for Americans, then it's likely more people with such an excellent beverage will come back to tea. And younger people will come back to tea. And the answer is yes. That's exactly how they've understood what we've accomplished here. And that's exactly why there's all this money available to go do it in China. We saw versions of it this time, this year, when we went to China. We were in Hefei. And we went to a couple of these shops where they're trying to do large cups. So what grade would we give them? We give them about a C plus. They um, are making inroads in it, but they don't really grok the rhythm of how we do this. And they're making different decisions, which is ending up in a less flavorful outcome. Remember, we're very clear with all of you. This is all about flavor at the end of the day. We're not selling rarity. We're not selling famousness. We're selling flavor. You come here to try extraordinary flavors, to try new flavors. Why is Rob trying to do a wrong ice cream for the flavor he loves that flavor and finds it so distinctive wouldn't it be great if you could go to rob's ice cream store and pick up a gallon of scarlet row ice cream by the way i'll report back once he accomplishes that i have no doubt in my mind he will accomplish it and he's going through I, yeah, this is the great thing about Rob. He is very scientific and step by step by step. And so he's eliminating slowly all the things that don't work. And he's zeroing in on something that is going to work. So this is this principle of taste. We do taste here. Yes. Peter says, cat's out of the bag. Rob needs to bring that to the shop. <laughs> well... Rob, I just built your market for you. So you you get it taken care of. And there will be a market for you. Jeremy comments, the leaves in the bag had hints of freshly turned earth. This transformed in the hot cup to aroma to me, a farm girl of Mon Alfalfa. And the deep and so an aroma of Mon Alfalfa and the deep amber broth. I'm so surprised by the gentle feel in my mouth, so swallowable, warming to the core. Okay, this comment encompasses a huge range 
of subjects. And we got to talk about these subjects. So let's start with the end. The end was her eyes deceived. Jeremy's eyes deceived her because they looked at this thing. It's dark, rich, beautiful, which means that when I taste this, this is going to have power that knocks me over. The answer is no. There is power that knocks you over, but not that way. She said it's gentle, warm, round. This is incredible. This comes from in the mountain, and it's gentle, warm, and round. How does that happen? It happens because we found the sweet spot in brewing. And that's the magic of going through all this experimentation. And that's why they get a C plus in Hefei, because they don't know what to look for in terms of the magic. Now let's talk about the rest of her comment. Alfalfa, moon alfalfa. That was the smell of the leaves, I think, when wet, right? Uh, yes. Yes, when wet. I love this comment. We're working with an agricultural product. Jeremy didn't say, oh, it's the smell of jade or the smell of, of something that is wild and, and, and you know far away. She brought it home. And she talked about the dry leaves having earthiness. So earthiness, moon alfalfa, to round and soft, deep, beautiful, and dark. What a wonderful description of this. Yes. Uh, Jenny shares, I like this one a lot. Fruity nose, ripe peach, plum, mango, undertones of maybe light mint, fenugreek. Fennel. The taste is clean. Thin, crisp tea water that changes the um, that changes the more sips that you take. It started very similar to the scent, and now it's shifting to more herbal. Love this comment. So Jen, and we'll start again at the end, talked about the um it, it, Again, she implied a comparison because she talked about the thinness of the tea. It looks like it should put you down. It's that dark. It should knock you over. And yet, it's got a thinness. It's got a roundness. It's very um, appealing. The nose is fruity. All sorts of stone fruits in there. And at the very end, a hint of herbal. This is incredible. This is magic tea. And there was one other part to her comment. What was yeah, that? Let's see. We've got the fruity nose, and she gives uh, many different descriptions of the fruit. And then the undertones, uh, which I am thinking from what you wrote, Jen, it's in the, also in the scent, undertones of maybe light mint. Uh, that's right. Fennel. That's what that's what I wanted to get to. Light mint, fenugreek, fennel. Now, normally, out of the barrel, if one starts off there, I usually don't quite easily accept that. But this isn't out of the barrel. And actually, I love this description, not so much as in the entryway, I love it as the aftertaste. When I said I felt or detected an aftertaste, mint was what I detected. That was exactly, and I get where you're going with fennel and fenugreek because it's all this kind of clean, nice aftertaste. That's the other thing you said. You said it was clean. In Chinese, this has a specific implication. The best of the tea, championship teas are always clean. No one wins 
if clean isn't part of the description of a championship team. Yes. Rob says, this tea is the color of bug trapping amber, and it's very clear. It smells of dried plum sweetness with hints of floral and roast, which gives the sense of an overall richness. So again, at the end, overall richness without question. And then we've got hints of fruit, hints of floral, and sweet. How in the world did these farmers get this out of that? Well, it starts with the terroir. And it starts with the specialness of this area. Then it moves to the skill levels. And by the way, next week, I know none of you have heard me labor on about all the techniques yet. I'm going to labor on about those next week. And we'll talk very specifically about techniques. But this week, following enlightenment and now taking you on an alien ship somewhere else, we're trying to understand everything that goes into a championship team. And you've identified it. Huge color, huge personality, sweet, floral, fruity, great aftertaste, minty, finagreaky, finnally. Nobody's commented on energetics yet. I know some of you are getting there. Because the energetics are, are clearly there. Yes. Andy shares, I'm getting a very mild spice note, something like black pepper or rye, but it, oh, does, it doesn't God. contribute much astringency to the, it doesn't contribute much astringency to the tea overall. And that's the comment. Love this comment, Andy, and the Chinese would love this comment. And I am so surprised. Well, why should I be? You're you're all the one percenters. So of course you would dig down and find this stuff. Absolutely. So Andy's comment is very well stated because he says there's a hint of spiciness and he identifies it. Pepperiness without huh? Yeah, right. And right. Without being astringent or on the surface but it's there in the background and it's definitely here in the background and i love the fact that you captured that because now as you pull all these comments together all of them are relevant to understanding the full picture of this tea this is why this is championship tea the chinese would also use the word spiciness they probably wouldn't have used black pepper. That's not wrong, though, what you used, Andy. In fact, it's exactly right, because the Chinese would have, they may not have actually identified a direct spice, but they would have said the hint of spiciness with it. And the reason they wouldn't have used black pepper is because they don't use a lot of black pepper in their cooking. But I do, and I get it, and that's on the money, yes. Peter says, this tea is going quickly, and it, it truly unfolds and changes. There's just so much to track. And can I say, it even has hints of umami as I'm way down in the cup? Love this comment. So Peter says, hey, you're not using the right word. It's unfolding as you go down the cup. And that's exactly right. It is unfolding. There is, and this is the beauty of championship rules. Very, very, very rarely do you get a single note championship rule. The championship rules, if that word leaves my mouth, it almost always means, oh, Things are going to unfold. You better look for lots of things. The other thing that Peter said, which I love, he said this thing is going quick. You know, for people that are drinking bad, I mean, way outside the mountain cliff tea, 
You can barely get it down. Especially once you've had stuff like this. Can't get it down. Cannot drink it. And certainly you can't drink it quickly. You think, where's, where's the flower pot? Where, where can I dump this off where nobody will see? Not this. This. It's hurry up. Let me get this thing unfolded. It's so interesting. Yes. Rob shares, it coats my tongue and feels light, but it simultaneously feels wet and dry. Love this comment. So again, with the unfolding, coats the tongue, feels light and wet, simultaneously wet and dry. And I understand this because the dry portion uh, is, hey, this is in the mountain cliff team. It's dry. It's astringent. A, it's got all this flavor. And as uh, I think Peter said, clear or clean. The, the combination of these comments shows your understanding of how the Chinese look at this. Because remember, Westerners who aren't accustomed to this have lazy language. You all who are accustomed and are practiced and have context have real sophisticated and great language surrounding the greatness of this team. Yes. Queenie shared, one would expect big warming, but the cooling minty aftertaste is traveling deeper to my soul, um, which is an unexpected change. So this is a really interesting energetics comment. Jeannie, right? Mm -hmm. Jeannie notes that the aftertaste is so strong, that coolingness is so strong, it goes down, and that's what's grounding her, the coolingness, rather than any other feeling, which with other teas she's had before. Love this comment because the coolingness in this tea is very distinctive. Peter shares, in comparison to what I associate with Wulongs that energetically go right to the core or very grounding and then maybe emanate out, I don't experience this as so differentiated between central core and periphery in my body. It's, it's all at once. This is a great comment. And it relates to genies because genie has this, hey, I get this minty cooling and it's just going through everything. And Peter says, everything that's happening in this is happening all at once. And the really great cliff teas are a mystery this way because when they're very hot, they're happening individually. The attributes, as they cool down, the really great ones, it is all happening at once. And the excitement of participating in an all at once experience, it is, now you know. Now, the boss said, and she reminded me before we got on the, the session today, she said, no treating this as if this is a favorite child. I love all the teas. All my children are my favorites. Nonetheless, happening all at once is very unique. Yes. Jennifer says, I'm late to the tasting, but my initial impression is heavy roast with deep minerality. So Jennifer uh, has come to this and she detects uh, distinct roast with lots of minerality. So what I would say is think about, well, you haven't heard all the other commentary and the other commentary is really important. You can kind of look back through the chat to see some of this commentary. The roast is there, there's no question, but that is not primary. The minerality is there, but that is not primary. There's a bunch of stuff happening all at the same time. And I think you must have just finished brewing yours, so you're at the beginning point, and as it cools, you're going to get Peter's everywhere, all at once coming. Yeah. Rob says, energetic, on energetics, I find this helps to silence distractions, and it brings other things into focus. Well, this is a great comment. From an energetic standpoint, Rob 
says, and in effect, he's pointing back to Peter. Everything all at once silences everything else and brings other things into focus. Jeremy says, I think it translates to highly satisfying in the largest sense. Would love to be with my friends, quaffing this, leaning back, just enjoying companionship and great tea. Uh, yes, Jeanine, good for the soul. You know, I love this comment because Jeremy is noting at the end of the day, we drink tea in company. We drink tea for enjoyment. We drink tea for being present, uh, for the love it engenders in us of the tea, of our surroundings, of the people around us, of the friendship that this tea engenders. Great comment, Jeremy. Yes. Peter says this would go well with Wulong ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, you really have your work cut out for you. No this pleasure. would go well with Oolong ice cream. Love this comment. All right. You know, you guys, I should be paying you because every week I find myself in the company of greatness. People who are able, that's you, who are able to taste into these teas and to reflect on them and be present with them and pull out the essences of these teas. You guys are unbelievable. You're great. So I salute you for all the commentary today. I mean, I was wondering what championship tea was going to elicit. You showed me this is great. And you know what? This is just the beginning next week. Genesis, a second championship team. You guys are so lucky. Somehow we put these all together. All right. So you have major responsibilities this week because next week is championship team number two. You got to stay healthy this week. You got to stay involved. You got to stay happy. And we look forward to seeing you next week with Genesis. You take care now. Bye-bye. Take care.